number one. That's where we'll be this morning. Luke chapter 19, verse number one. We'll read down to verse number 10. Luke chapter number 19. Luke 19, verse one says this, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Verse number three, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Verse 6, And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that the purpose of your son's life was to come to earth and to die for us. We thank you that he sought us out and uh, he paid the price for our sin. And uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for that. We want to praise you uh, for that. We thank you for the beautiful building that you've given us to meet in today. We thank you that we're protected from the elements 
And Lord, I pray that you would just calm our hearts, quiet our minds, to be able to listen to what your word has to say to us this morning. We pray that we would just be attentive to your word. We pray that you would be with pastor as he preaches. Just give him wisdom from on high. In your name I pray. Amen. And when 
Pray with me if you will. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the music that we have had today that has reminded us just how awesome you are. And Lord, we do serve an awesome God. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would learn to claim the promises that are in your word. Lord, of how much that you love us and how much you desire for us to have a relationship with you. And I pray, God, that we would be uh, those that would go out and help people to find, Lord, the true answer. And that is you. Lord, I pray, God, that the songs that were sung today would not be mere words to those of us who, who sang it. Lord, and that's all of us today. Lord, whether it be congregational, choir, uh, Lord, whatever, whether whatever was played. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, to, to know you in that way. Lord, I pray that you'd bless uh, the message today. If we ask this in your precious name, amen. This morning, the title of the message is this. It takes one to reach one. It takes one to reach one. In uh, Luke's gospel, we have for us in chapter 19, probably a passage of scripture that if you've been in church very long, you've heard people quote because it is true. Verse number 10 tells us this. Jesus saying himself for the son of man. And as we've studied in the book of John, that's one of the titles that, that Jesus used most for himself, referring back to him as the Messiah. It says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. We are to be soul seekers. We are to be out uh, just as Jesus did looking for people. Jesus set an example for us in going out, in reaching people, whether he was preaching in masses or he was going after an individual. Jesus gave us and painted a great picture for us. You can, uh, you can never tell what God is going to do with a gospel witness. Many years ago in St. Louis, a Christian man completed some business with a lawyer. And before leaving the office, the Christian turned uh, to the lawyer and said, I've often wanted to ask you a question, but I've been a coward. The lawyer was surprised. I don't think you uh, were afraid of anything, he said. What's the question? And the client asked him this, why aren't you a Christian? The lawyer hung his head. You know my weakness, he said. Isn't there something in the Bible about drunkards and having no part in the kingdom of God? Not to be detoured, the Christian said, that's not what I'm asking you. I want to know why you are not a Christian. Well, said the lawyer, I can't recall that anybody ever asked me that. And I'm sure nobody has ever told me how to become a Christian. Before long, the two were praying together and God moved in the lawyer's life and he saved him and immediately broke the power of drink that had bound him. The lawyer's name, Cyrus L. Schofield, who later edited the most famous uh, his famous Schofield Reference Bible, one of the most widely used study Bibles in the world. You see, it takes one to reach one. As we talked about last week, souls are important to God. If we're going to have his vision for our life, if our eyes are ever going to be toward the Lord, we have to know how important souls are. And souls are very important to Jesus Christ. He gives us three stories showing how important souls were. And as he was going out reaching people for souls, he met people where they were, so to speak. Turn to Luke chapter number seven. We're gonna be back in, in Luke 18 and Luke 19. But Luke chapter number seven, we have the, the, the first picture where he reached someone through their emotional need. Anybody in here ever had an emotional need? I mean, we're a pretty needy people, aren't we? Boy, when, when, when things get down in our life and, and, and we are really struggling with things, we really want to have an answer. We're looking for somebody to come along and love us. In Luke chapter number uh, uh, seven, starting in verse 36, we have a story of something that took place in Jesus' life. Verse number 36 says, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. 
Now, Jesus not only accepted the hospitality of the publicans and sinners, which the Pharisees were quick to point out, why do you eat with Pharisees and sinners? Why do you, why, why, why do you mess with these people that, that, that are sinners? Jesus said, as we, we talked about last week, hey, those who are whole don't need a physician. He says, I've come, I've come. And so, but there he was with the Pharisee. You know why? Why did he go eat with the Pharisee? Because they needed the word of God too, whether they realized it or not. Now we trust that Simon's invitation was a sincere one and not one with an ulterior motive, having Jesus in his house. And so we see something take place. The Bible tells us this, verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat, in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash uh, the feet, excuse me, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and and anointed them with ointment. The first picture that we see here is we see a woman that is coming full of repentance. Now, this is very strange to us. I mean, if anybody was to come and mess with our feet, we would probably freak out. Would we not? The custom of that day, though, was because they wore sandals, there was always a servant in the home that when you came in, you would take your sandals off and they would wash your feet for you. They would take care of that. Somehow, this got missed. Now also, these banquets, this banquet that Jesus was was invited to, it was customary uh, for that day for outsiders to hover around uh, during banquets so they could watch the important people and, uh, and, and hear the conversations they have. Since it was, it was open, they could even enter the banquet hall and speak to the guest. It, it was just part of it. Now, often uh, when they would come in, they, they didn't eat like we did where we would sit at a table. There would be a table and they would be lounging so that their feet would be behind them. Now, I, I've never laid down and tried to eat. I just don't think I could do that. But this is the custom of the day. And so there Jesus was. And when this woman who was a sinner, heard that Jesus was there, she came to him. Now, this explains how the woman had access to Jesus. Now, he was not behind locked doors. In that day, though, very important thing to realize that women were never invited to the banquet. This was a men's only thing. Now, she was the uninvited and unwanted guest at that banquet because of her reputation. The Bible says that she was a sinner. So most likely the way that it's pointing out and the way as you'll see the story goes, she was probably a harlot, a woman that sold herself to get by. And we would have to agree that 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 is a sin. She was a sinner and she realized uh, that she was a sinner. Now, in, in doing that, the, 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 the people, I'm sure, felt uncomfortable, especially the men, that, that this type of woman was there. But she came to perform an act of servitude by washing Jesus' feet. It said that she arrived, and it doesn't even say she even talked to him. And she began, it said that she brought an alabaster box, which was a very uh, precious ointment. And she brought it into the banquet table because she wanted to anoint him. It was very valuable. It was very personal. And then not only that, but she was crying so profusely that she could take the very tears and they were falling upon his dust-covered feet. And she was taking her hair, which is a woman's glory. She began wiping the dirt off with her hair. I couldn't imagine it. I mean, I've tried to wrap my mind around this picture. How humbling it must be to do that. But yet there she was in pure humility with a repentant heart performing that which a servant would do. 
She came to the Lord humbly and her actions showed a repentant heart. I mean, not only did she wash her, his feet and anoint his feet, but she also kissed his feet. There is nothing more humbling than that. And she wasn't doing it in secret. There was nothing provocative going on. Her heart was broken because of her sin. And she knew because Jesus had been preaching in the area. Study the word. She had probably heard the invitation. She had probably heard about Jesus because there were masses of people that had heard the message. And when she heard there was a place where she could have access to get to Jesus, she came. She came. But we see there was a very critical host. Look at verse 39. And when the Pharisee uh, which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. He didn't say this out loud. He wasn't talking to the guy next to him. He was just simply saying inside himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Boy, can, can you just get the, just fill. Why would you say he acted like that? Because I believe that Simon was embarrassed, both for himself and for his guest, at the appearance of this woman. After all, you have to understand, he was, he was, he was taking a chance and inviting Jesus. Remember the Pharisees and the scribes were always critical of Jesus. But yet here now he has invited this, this new popular preacher. This one where, where crowds are gathering around. He invited him into his, his home. He invited him to this banquet. Now all of a sudden riffraff shows up. People that didn't dress like them. People that didn't act like them. And the people around there probably looked at her with disdain. How embarrassing that is for me. Do you get it? Would to God that nobody would ever walk through the doors of this church and get that kind of reception from anyone. From anyone. She was looking for the Savior. And she came in. And there he was. But also, think of this. He thought, his thought about Jesus, he's supposed to be this great prophet. He's probably just a fraud. Probably just somebody who's, who's coming by night. He's probably not, not, he's probably just a fake. Because truly, if he was a prophet, he would know. He would know what type of woman this was. He would know. You see, Jewish rabbis did not speak to the woman in public. They, they did not speak to women in public, nor did they eat with them in public. So why would this miracle-working, super popular prophet allow such a woman to touch him? You see, Simon's real problem was spiritual blindness. He didn't see himself equally as a sinner or this woman as a lost soul who was looking for forgiveness. Really, he thought he was Bart better than you. But then Simon's thoughts were challenged by the Savior. Verse number 40 says, And Jesus answering and said unto them, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. He showed respect for, for Jesus speaking directly to him. Called him master or teacher, say on. So Jesus paints a scenario for him and says this. There was a, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. And one of them owed 500 uh, pence and the other 50. And when, excuse me, uh, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him the most? Got two people. 
One guy owes 500, one guy owes what? Five. Guy forgives their debt. Ask him a simple question. Who's gonna love this guy the most? Simon answers and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most and he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. I mean, Simon knew the answer. I mean, if somebody forgave you a great debt, you would be very thankful for them. What if tomorrow you got a letter from the bank? You know, you've been a really good customer. Here's the deed to your house. How many of you would just pass out? Yeah, amen, yeah. Or you went to the bank and they said, you know, you've been such a good customer. We're gonna go ahead and pay your car off for you. I'm sure we wouldn't say, no thanks. We'd be very thankful. Probably even write a thank you note to them. This guy, I suppose, and I suppose the one forgave them the most. So then Jesus tells him that he, he, he answered correctly. Now the, peril does, the parable does not deal with the amount of sin in a person's life, but the awareness of sin in his heart. How much sin must a person commit to be a sinner? Simon and the woman were both sinners. Simon was guilty of sin of the spirit, especially pride. While the woman was guilty of sins of the flesh, her sins were known, while his sins were hidden by everyone but God, to, to everyone but God. Both Simon and the woman were both spiritually bankrupt. They were spiritually bankrupt and could not pay their debt to God. The difference was she recognized her need while Simon did not. So then we see a forgiving savior. Look at the rest of the story. Verse number 44. After Jesus says, thou hast rightly judged, he says in verse 44, and he turned to the woman and said to Simon, can you just picture this? Here he is looking, Jesus is looking at the woman, but he is addressing the Pharisee. See thou this woman, I entered into thine house and thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed uh, my feet with ointment. Therefore, I say unto thee, remember, he's still looking at her, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loveth much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. You see, Simon failed to be a gracious host. All the expected and common duties he failed to do but she did. Her actions spoke louder than his words. The woman is directly addressed by Jesus publicly to tell her her sins are forgiven. There were two people in need that day. One recognized their need. And the Savior was able to look directly into their eyes and into their heart and was able to say, thy faith have saved thee. See, in every church, you have people just like this. You have people that are saved because they have recognized the fact that they needed Jesus Christ's forgiveness. 
Then you have people that have invited Jesus to be a part of their life, but not into their heart. They're religious, but they're lost. Jesus could see her faith and saw none in his. And how was this woman saved? She repented of her sins and put her faith in Jesus. The Bible tells us, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How did she know she was truly forgiven? She had the assurance of his word. It wasn't some man that said that. It was Jesus Christ himself looking her in the eye saying, thy faith uh, has saved thee. Thy faith has saved thee. Her love for the Lord was expressed in her sacrificial devotion to him. That was her proof of salvation. For the first time in her life, she could truly go in peace with God. Just as Jesus said, said to go in peace. We are told in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Second picture. Luke chapter 18. Excuse me for a moment. Chapter 18, starting in verse 35. I'll give you a second to get there. Jesus Christ reached a woman in her emotional need. Secondly, we see that he reached uh, someone through a physical need. Through a physical need. Look with me if you would, please. Starting in verse number five. And it came to pass that he was come nigh unto Jericho. A certain man sat in the wayside begging. In other words, he was sitting out on the main road because people were coming by and he was begging for alms. He was was asking for, for money. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And so he goes into action. He cried saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him and said that he should hold his peace. You be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. I mean, think about it. If there was anybody that had a need that should be brought to Jesus, especially because people now, Jesus is on his way to the cross. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. It's not like he hadn't been around for almost three years. Jesus was the one that healed, that, that healed the blind. People should have been taking him there. And instead they're telling him, hey, you're, you're, you're not worth it. You be quiet. Hold your peace. Picking back up in verse number 39. But he cried so much the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded that he, for him to be brought to him. And when he was come near, he asked him saying, What wilt that thou, that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Let's stop right there for just a moment. See, Jesus was passing by a man in need. He was physically blind and he, he, uh, he needed to have his eyesight. In Mark chapter 10, verse 46, we read about this man. It says, and they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great uh, number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of T- uh, Timaeus, uh, sat uh, by Uh, the highway side begging. This man was sitting outside the city by the roadside. He was dependent on others' mercy in order for him to eat every day. To have his his needs met every day, he was dependent on somebody else. He was a beggar. I couldn't imagine being without a job for so long or or to be physically enabled to, to hold down a job to have to depend upon my livelihood this way. But he did. Now, Jesus was passing, and he was the only one that could help him. 
Bartimaeus perceived that something was going on. He could tell by, by the noise of the people that something was, was taking place. Bartimaeus immediately uh, sought to gain the attention of Jesus by recognizing who Jesus was. You see, this title that he was shouting out, thou son of David, was a popular uh, Jewish designation for the Messiah. And Bartimaeus confessed his faith in his Messiahship or the Messiahship of Jesus. He recognized through the stories and stuff that he had heard, he had never met him before, but after hearing all the stories that people had told, he said, surely this must be the Messiah. And so he was hollering out, thou son of David, have mercy on me. As blind as he was, he saw more than those who spoke of the Lord as Jesus of Nazareth, thus making a Jesus different from any other man who was just merely passing by. Bartimaeus uh, was persistent uh, in, in calling out he was persistent uh, that, that, that only Jesus could help. Now you can imagine as he's trying to yell how loud a crowd is. I mean, it, it, in here, sometimes when, when people are just talking, sometimes it takes somebody up here with a microphone a minute or so to get everybody's attention. Can you imagine sitting by the roadside trying to get Jesus' attention as a group of people are coming by? But you know what? I believe that Jesus knew right where he was. Bartimaeus uh, uh, was brought before Jesus and he asked him, well, what is it that you, that you need from me? And he said that I might receive my sight. To which Jesus replies, look at verse number 42. And Jesus said unto him, receive thy sight. Receive thy sight. I'm going to heal you because you recognized and you called out and called me the son of David. Is that what it says? I'm going to heal you because I need to put one more miracle in my pocket while I'm on my way. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and reach out to you and uh, get, get, get a photo op for the, the local papers so that people could see that I treat people nice. Is that what it says? Is this thing on? Is that what it says? Okay, you have the word of God in front of you. It's okay to answer. No. What does it say? Thy faith have saved thee. If there's anybody who knows the heart of man and knows what our needs are, it's Jesus Christ. He knows them before we ask them. And he knows whether we're asking in faith or not. Jesus understood that this man had faith in who he was. And he received his sight. And the Bible says, and immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. People were praising the Lord for what they saw, this physical need that was met in this man's life. And he was physically healed because of his faith. The woman who, had, who washed Jesus' feet was saved because of her faith. It's because of her faith. It says, thy faith has saved thee. He just didn't get a sight change. He got a heart change. He got a heart change. Now that brings us into the story uh, that Robert read in our scripture reading. Many of you have heard this story. You've, you've sang the song. You've sang the song about little wee Zacchaeus. You see here, Jesus did not only just reach somebody through an emotional need or somebody through a physical need, but here Jesus reaches somebody through a spiritual need and Zacchaeus had a need. You see, a lot of people want to be healed from physical needs who really need to have the spiritual blindness taken off their life. The Bible tells in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he's a warder of them that diligently seek him. I believe that Zacchaeus was searching for an answer because he was a man who was most miserable in the state that he was living in. By spiritual standards, because by worldly standards, he was okay. Let's get into this real quick. 
It says, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. To be chief among the publicans meant that he was a man of power. He presided over the other tax gatherers or collectors who received their collections and, trans, uh, and trans, uh, transferred them through him to the Roman government. Most of these tax collectors collected more than what the Romans required and lined their pockets with that. And so he would line his pockets with their taxes to make sure that they, they paid the taxes. But that's how these guys got rich. These were Jewish people who were working for the Roman government, so the people just didn't like them. All the way back in Bible days, people just did not like people who collected taxes. Okay? It just, it hasn't ended today either. And uh, uh, he had the authority of the oppressive Roman government behind him, and he was willing to be an outcast among his own people just to be rich. By worldly standards, if you read verse number one, he was a man with power and he was a man with money. Isn't that what all men seek? Hey, guy's got money. Guy's got power. He's got authority. What more does a man need? I'm sure he had the latest chariot. Probably had the finest clothes. Lived in a super nice house. I'm sure if he was married, his wife was model pretty. He had everything going for him. But he was miserable. He's miserable. Verse number three, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. Oh, well, there was one thing about his life he didn't like. He was a short guy. Probably had short man syndrome. but he was a man that was most miserable. Why do you keep saying that? Because of his actions. Here's a man with power and with money who in worldly standards didn't need anything. But yet in verse number four it says, and he ran before all of the people and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was to pass that way. To see who? To see this miracle worker. To see this man, Jesus. Whom this, this, I, I can't take you to chapter and verse. I'm just, I'm, I'm just guessing. Had probably heard Jesus preach before. Had probably heard some of his messages. Probably listened to them from afar. But he was curious enough and miserable enough for a man of his reputation to climb into a tree just to see Jesus. So many times there are people that, that, that will enter the doors of our businesses or our church or our homes that outwardly we would look at and say they got it all but secretly inside are saying I'm empty I'm hollow I need something I believe that Zacchaeus was looking for something and knew he could only find it in Jesus why would he climb the tree? Why would he climb the tree? Verse number five. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. Oh, man. Oh, man. Now, let me ask you a question. Just be honest with you. Do you think Zacchaeus was the only person up in the trees I mean, if there were that many people and the streets were narrow, there were people all over the place looking. 
You ever heard of somebody popular walking down the sidewalk? And we try, we stretch to see who that person is. Remember one time I was telling the kids in chapel Wednesday, um, Friday that I saw this massive group of, peop- group of people coming down the Virginia Beach, uh, whatever you call it, boardwalk. And I'm thinking, I wonder who that is. Seems awfully important. It was Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. He was gonna buy a hotel down there. He was just walking down with his entourage. And man, people, the traffic was stopping because of this one person. Jesus was a pretty popular person. There were probably people all in the trees that were there. But Jesus knew there was someone looking for him. Verse number five. And when he saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. What in the world was Jesus doing? Jesus stopped because he knew this man had a need. And he said, Zacchaeus, he says, I'm going to stay with you tonight. I'm going to stay with you tonight. I don't think Zacchaeus had some big sign holding up saying, hey, stay with me. Free lodging tonight. But Jesus knew he had a need. I think sometimes God impresses upon people to come to a Christian or to go to a church service or to turn on a radio and they just happen to or somebody, a business person sitting in a hotel and opens up the drawer finding a Bible and they start reading. And God starts speaking to them. Zacchaeus had an immediate heart change when he met Jesus. Verse number six says, and he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured. What? I mean, excuse me, murmured saying, that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Who do you think was saying that? The religious crowd. All the Billy and Betty's better than you. Of all the people he could stay with, him, there was a purpose. Jesus never addressed somebody without a purpose. But you know what? Zacchaeus didn't let what the world was saying about him hinder him. Verse number eight says, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. Now, remember who he's addressing. He's addressing God. He's addressing the miracle worker. He's addressing the master of the universe. And he makes a commitment to him. And he says, half of all I own, I give to the poor. Think about it. Just like that. He wanted to give. Then he starts confessing his sin. He says, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore unto him fourfold. He already just gave half of his stuff away and now he's going to make sure and he's going to go back in his accounts and he's going to pay back people who he cheated. Do you think Jesus made a difference in this man's life? He made a difference. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Zacchaeus was very lost. He was looking for an answer. He was a man who had a spiritual need. And Jesus came and filled that need. We have a woman with an emotional need. We had a man who had a physical need. 
when a man had a spiritual need. And you know what made the difference in all of their lives? Their faith in Jesus Christ. Because it's Jesus alone that can save us. You see, Jesus gave all of us the commandment, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'll win the, the message this, this, this morning with a song. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to read it to you. That was written by a, 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 a Christian singer by the name of Babby Mason. The title of the song is this, Each One Reach One. See, I believe it's important for us as Christians to follow Christ's example. He was able simply to reach people where they were. All of us can identify with someone. And if we pray, God will bring those people into our life so that we can give the light to them. Listen to the words of this song. Tonight a man is somewhere. Tonight a man is somewhere proclaiming the good news, winning families to Jesus all around his neighborhood. He tells them that God is able to make their house a home. He wants to win his world to Christ, but he can't do it alone. But if each one can reach one, as we follow after Christ, we all can lead one. We can lead one to the Savior. And together we can tell the world that Jesus is the way if we each one reach one. The message is unchanging. Go ye into all the world and share the love of Jesus Far away or door to door. You see, just like somebody told you that Jesus loves you so, you must tell someone who will tell someone until the whole world knows that each one can reach one. As we follow after Christ, we all can lead one. We can lead one to the Savior. And together we can tell the world that Jesus is the way if we each one reach one. Let's have his vision for souls. Stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. With everybody's head bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask a question again. How many people here know without a shot of a doubt that if they were to die today or if Jesus Christ was to come back and, and, uh, and rapture his church home, that you would go to heaven? You have no doubt because you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Would you lift, uplift your hands? You know that 100% sure. There's no doubt. No doubt whatsoever. Thank you for being honest. Maybe you're in here this morning and I... I couldn't get a glimpse of, of, of all the, the folks that are here, but maybe, maybe just maybe you're here this morning and you don't know. Maybe you identify kind of like that Pharisee and I, I'm, not, I'm not putting you down, please. But maybe you believe that that religion will save you. Maybe, you, you know, I, I, the, the things that you do, you, you, I've, I've come to church and, I, and, I, and I've sat in the pew and I, I've given money and, I, and I'm a nice person. I'm, I'm pretty morally clean. The Pharisee was still a sinner who needed saving. Or perhaps you're in here and, and, and you've had a, a physical need. Maybe you just need to have faith in the Lord that, that, that he would help you to understand the purpose of, of why you have that need. And maybe through that, he's just trying to draw you to him. Or maybe you've come this morning with just a spiritual need. Saying, you know what? I, I, I'm a man most miserable. I'm a woman most miserable. By worldly standards, I, 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 the, the world would say I'm doing okay. But, but inside, I'm just empty. I want to fill this void. Why not let somebody take the word of God this morning and show you how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ? The people are here. They're wanting to help. 
And let me speak to the Christians. Maybe you're here this morning and the Lord's been speaking to your heart about your need to tell someone. Ask God to put somebody on your heart. Ask somebody to put somebody on your heart that you could take a track to, who you can tell your, your, your story to, your testimony, so you could be one that reaches one. Whatever your need is, the altars are open. Father, just pray, Lord, you'd be with this time of invitation. We ask this in your precious name, amen.